eleventh day, in the eleventh month, in the eleventh hour, bells were rung throughout the world. The war and wars had had its day. All right, we're in, excited to introduce our next speaker. He grew up in southern Minnesota. He's an activist, writer, editor, and teacher. He's based in Minneapolis for the last 40 years. He's had a host of experience doing many different jobs, including cab driver. I bet he gleaned a lot of his knowledge from driving cab, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now he writes a newsletter, Nygaard Notes, on various topics of interest for on politics and culture, and it's called nygaardnotes.org, is it? Dot org? Dot org, yeah. Yeah, so check that out. His work has peer, appeared in many media publications, including TV, KFAI radio, and I, and I want to you all to give him a very warm welcome, Jeff Nygaard. Okay, thanks a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's a good way to start out. <coughs> the theme of the day is surveillance. Boy, you can't see very well, can you? Are you out there? Yeah, good. There's fat flash bulbs, too. The theme of the day is surveillance, but um, I'm going to talk about its kissing cousin, propaganda. Uh, surveillance is when they want to know what we say and do. Propaganda is when we're forced to hear what they say and do. Um, the, the re I think the starting point really is we, um, at this point in history, we just have to accept that there basically is no privacy in the United States. We have to assume as activists that everything we do or say is available to the authorities. I'm not endorsing that. But if we start from that point, then I think the question is, what can we do given that reality? What can we do? Do we just go and, go and hide? You know, is that one option? I don't think so. Well, it is an option, I guess. But you can't hide. So I think the, the, the beauty of my presentation, <laughs> from my point of view, <laughs> is that what I'm going to talk about, propaganda and anti-propaganda work, is something that uh, not only can be done in the open, it should be done, it has to be done in the open. In other words, if we're in the business of consciousness and changing consciousness, then we have to reach a broad audience. And we're in the interest, and we're in the business of building a movement, we have to reach a broad audience. And not only to recruit, um, you know, propaganda is aimed at uh, identifying two groups of people, customers, and dissenters. They want there to be more of the former and fewer of the latter. But what we're trying to do in building a movement, I think, is to work on the level of consciousness because uh, in order for any regime uh, of surveillance or anything else to succeed, you need at least the tacit support or endorsement of the general population. Nobody, in, whether a democratic uh, system or a totalitarian system, can really go along without some support or at least acquiescence of the, ma of the mass of people. So in service of that, what I'm going to suggest is that we have a propaganda system in place that is aimed at building that kind of unanimity, yet kind of support what Chomsky and Herman call the manufacture of consent. Um, and I, what I want to suggest, which is a little different, is when people think of propaganda, they often think that they often think of the the tip of the iceberg, which is the people who are putting out propaganda that we're supposed to believe. Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, or you know Vladimir Putin is a devil incarnate. Whatever it is, we're supposed to believe. That is part of it, but I'm going to suggest that that's the smallest part of it. And the only reason that stuff works is because of a larger system, and system is the key word of propaganda in which we all participate in one way or another. And hopefully as I go along talking here, and I'm actually I'm a better writer than talker, if you want to sign up for my newsletter, Nygaard Notes, there's a little sheet over here, I go over this stuff in much more detail, and I've been doing it for about 15 years. Um, what I want to suggest is that there's 
a set of ideas and a way of thinking that is promoted throughout the system that leads us to go along with what's happening. It leads us to support the very inhumane institutions and structures that serve the 1%. So here's my definition of propaganda just to start things out. Propaganda is the process by which particular ideas, doctrines, images, ideologies, and ways of thinking are consistently produced, distributed, and encouraged throughout a social system, and by which countervailing ideas, doctrines, images, ideologies, and ways of thinking are systematically repressed, suppressed, and or discouraged. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, and there's not much time actually, but I'm going to keep it brief because I want to have a little time for you guys to talk. Um, first, I'll talk about why would you study media, which is my specialty. Um, I want to talk about the different levels at which propaganda operates. I want to talk, suggest that there's a, uh, an in, what's called an investment theory uh, of uh, propaganda and ideology. And then I want to talk about what I'm calling lately systolectics which is a kind of a merging of a, a dialectical process of thinking and a systems approach to uh, what we're talking about, whatever it is. So hopefully this will make sense as we go along. If not, my bad. So let's just start with a joke, um, which is relevant to the presentation, actually. Um, does anybody know if you have a problem with your spine, what kind of fish would you look for? You would look for a neurosturgeon. <laughs> of course. And we'll come back to that. that, that the, the reason anybody laughed has a lot to do with my presentation. So, there, when I'm suggesting that um, there's a propaganda system in place. I think it's really important for activists to understand how that works, because when we understand how it works, we can A, defend ourselves individually against propaganda. That's important. We can also be aware of it as we set up a new system of information, because journalism and media are central to any, any sort of society at all. Most of what we know about the world after high school or college comes through media, unless it's in you know, personal experience. Experience. So it's really important to understand how it works. Because how do we challenge it unless we know how it works? And there are various doctrinal, what I call doctrinal institutions that pass on ideas and ways of thinking. Church, school, um, higher, uh, higher education too, um, the punditocracy, public relations industry, advertising industry, all these things. But why do I choose to focus on media? There's five reasons. First of all, media is omnipresent. You, you, you can go to church, you go to school, you don't go to media. You're always in media. It's everywhere. It's all every day. Um, exposure to media is unlike other institutions. It's lifelong and involuntary. You can graduate from school. You can leave your family. You can change churches, but you can't get away from media. And it goes on from the day you're born until the day you die in this culture. So it's very, um, it's 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 omnipresent, lifelong and involuntary. It's easy to study because of those first two things. It's everywhere. It's everybody knows media. Everybody sees media, everybody hears media, so it's easy to look at. It comes out every day, new examples. That's a lot of what my newsletter is. I just take whatever was ever is in the paper this week and say, look, do you see the ideas here? Um, another unique thing about media is media alone among doctrinal institutions um, says it's a doctrinal institution. There's the myth of objectivity. Churches, schools, uh, all kinds of you know book clubs, whatever it is, they all say they're telling you ideas, they're teaching you ideas. Media says, no, 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 we're just telling you what is. <laughs> Don't, right? That's the idea, it's objective. That, in fact, that's the highest value in professional journalism. It's, it's a myth, but it's highly valued. A highly valued myth. Um, and of course, the obvious thing, the fifth point, is that media is a mass phenomenon. It touches everybody. You can't really opt out of media. You can hear different media, and people think that in the age of the internet, you can sort of choose your media, but when it comes to news, journalism, uh, what's actually happening is kind of the opposite. There's more outlets for news, but there's fewer people generating the journalism that make up the actual content of the news. So we can comment, and that's a lot of what I do. I comment on journalism. 
but I don't have the resources to travel to Iraq and tell you what's happening. Journalists do that. Activists do it too. But activists do it, but if anybody gets to know about it, guess who? The media has to tell them. Well, that's why WikiLeaks, um, you know, that's why Ed Snowden didn't just uh, get on the phone and call his friends and say, look what I got. He got on the phone and told The Guardian, Der Spiegel, The New York Times. You see what I'm saying? So, so my five reasons for studying media, it's omnipresent, it's lifelong and involuntary, it's easy to study, it uh, thinks it's objective and it fools a lot of people, and it's a mass phenomenon. So recall the fish joke about the neurosturgeon. The reason anybody laughed or anybody laughs at any joke is because they already know something. So in this case, a joke is funny, because, that joke, if you think it is funny, which I do, um, it's funny because you know something about fish, right? And you know something about surgeons, and you know something about n neurosurgery, a little bit anyway, you know it's complicated, I don't do it. <laughs> Just in case you're wondering. <laughs> That's not part of today's presentation. So you know some things, and then when somebody tells a joke and it violates those rules or those understandings, it becomes funny. That's another reason why media is pretty funny a lot of times, but that's another subject. <laughs> so the point is, this is actually how we make meaning, not just humor, any meaning. When a fact that's new comes into our heads or comes into our awareness, it only makes sense if we already know something. It has to be connected to what I call an anchor. There has to be an anchor. So, so somebody says, let's use the obvious one. Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction. A, a lot of people believe that. Not probably the people who are saying it, but a lot of people hearing it believed it. Why? Well, there's all, you can speculate, but the, the point is there's all kinds of reasons. Racism is part of it, I think. That kind of person, that kind of human being would do that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, Anti-Arab sentiment, you know, it's like, oh, well, those kind of people, of course they're out to attack us, they hate us, they hate our freedoms, blah, 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 blah. That all made sense. Why? It's connected to something that was already there in a lot of people's heads. That's how we make meaning. And that's part of how propaganda, overt propaganda, works and what I want to suggest here is that propaganda operates on at least two levels, actually multiple levels, but I'll simplify it to two. What I call overt propaganda and deep propaganda. If you read my newsletter, you know this already, so you can, just, you can take a nap. We'll be back in a minute. Um, <laughs> overt propaganda is the thing we're supposed to believe. Deep propaganda is the thing that makes it believable. Right? I also call deep propaganda sometimes the ABCs of propaganda. Um, so, for example, um, overt propaganda about Social Security, it's going broke. Right? Well, what's the deep propaganda? Government pro programs never work. Or, better yet, the market works. And that's not in the market, so it can't work. Right? So that's a deep idea about like w w what's effective, what works, what doesn't work, who's successful, you know, wh how do human needs get met? All those ideas are underneath there. They're never stated, usually, in the media when there's a report about Social Security going broke. The trust fund is going broke. You've heard this. It's not true. But you've heard it, and a lot of people think it is true. Not because somebody said, explain the deep reason why it is true, because it's not. They rely on those pre-existing ideas, the same as I rely on you knowing something about fish, so my joke makes you laugh. It's the same idea. That's how we make meaning. We attach new information to existing information that's in us. So over-propaganda tends to be specific and conscious. Somebody says something, and they know what they're saying, and they want you to believe it. That's very specific. They're conscious of it. You're conscious of it. Um, deep propaganda is just is is general and unconscious. And like oh, those kind of things. And you, if you ask somebody, and I've done this, you know, what do you know about Social Security? They don't know much about it at all. They don't even know what the trust fund is. They have really wacky ideas about it. But that's never talked about. That's never argued because everybody knows it. Right? So what I'm suggesting is activists, well, let, let me just say a little more about it because it's, it's the idea that it, it operates on multiple levels is a foreign one to some people. But 
the way you can discover deep propaganda in the news, for example, is you can ask, when you take in something, you can ask yourself, now why should I believe this? What would I have to believe in order to believe this? Um, in fact, the title of this book I've been working on for about the last 20 years is um, 21st Century Propaganda, How What We Believe Affects What We Believe. Um, <laughs> important point is that overt propaganda is largely, if not exclusively, external. That is, it comes to us from the outside. Deep propaganda resides here and here. Now, of course, it originally came from, you know, weren't born with deep propaganda. Well, I don't know, maybe you are, but I don't think so. We get it from all these doctrinal institutions over time. You get ideas that about, about race, about gender, about uh, public and private, about the market, about motivation, you, it goes so it goes very deep. You know, you get ideas about are, are people like there's a big argument in the in the think tank world in academia. Uh, are people basically bad, and society makes them better? Are people basically good, and society corrupts them? You know, there's these these are really deep ideas, and everybody has them. And a good propagandist susses out the, the most easily digested, uh, deep, or most widely accepted, rather, deep propaganda, and bases their overt propaganda upon it. So you put out something, public relations people are, this, that's what they do. They figure out what people already have, and then they figure out what they can build on top of that. So they can sell products, or sell war, or sell something. So I talked about the propaganda ABCs, which I like to say stand for attitudes, beliefs, and conceptions about how the world works, ABCs. So for example, uh, let's take uh, terrorism. The attitude is an attitude toward the other. They're dangerous, they're crazy, they're hateful, they don't, they, they, they don't, they're not like us. The belief, is a belief that there is something called the other. That th there are some people who are just different. They're identifiable. We know they're not like us. They're the threat. That's the belief. The conception, oh, this is just one set of ABCs for this particular idea. A conception of the world as a, as a dangerous place, filled with people who hate our freedom, they're out to get us, they resent us, they're envious, whatever it is, but they're not like us. And of course, laying underneath this, because I, like I said, I simplify it to two levels, but another deeper level is the idea of an us. That there's, that people, I think pretty much everywhere, have some idea about who's us and who's not us. And a propagandist plays on that. In fact, that's, in my opinion, kind of the basis of war. And there has to be some other that's not like us. Otherwise, how could we attack and kill them? So I have a couple of examples just to illustrate, because this is a little theoretical, maybe. Is it? Are you, are you following me so far? Yeah? More jokes? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's my, I got a lot of them. I got a, I got a million of them. All right, we'll get back to the examples. So here's some examples uh, I hope will illustrate the point. There was a uh, piece um, on N National Public Radio um, in April about this hepatitis C drug you might have heard. It's called uh, Sovaldi, and it's put out by a, a company, a pharmaceutical company called Gilead Sciences. They came up with this really great uh, hepatitis C drug, and four or five, or three or four million people in the US have hepatitis C. It destroys your liver, it's a serious thing. So they're always looking for drugs. So uh, Gilead came up with Sovaldi, and they decided, since they have a patent, of course, they decided to, uh, well, here, I'll just read the headline in the first paragraph. Costly hepatitis C pill shreds drug industry sales record. The lead paragraph. The launch of Sovaldi, the $1,000 a day pill for hepatitis C, is shaping up as the most successful ever. The Food and Drug Administration approved the pill in December, and then Gilead Sciences was off to the races. The company said it sold $2.27 billion worth of Sovaldi in the quarter that ended March 31st. The BAFO number beat Wall Street's estimate for the quarter, unquote. 
So again, no argument about the facts. I'm sure all those numbers are correct. What's the idea that makes those, what they're reporting make sense? There's an idea about the meaning of success. It's a business perspective. From a business point of view, that's a boffo number. I love that. Yeah. Boffo. Um, for people with hepatitis C, or the taxpayers who are going to ultimately pay for that, that is not a success. But it's an idea. They never say, that this is what success means. It's just assumed. And by the way, coincidentally, uh, or, or related to that, the, the title, the, the name that NPR gives their... their um, um, the health section is Health Inc. So there's something right there. Um, here's another example. This is this is it's easier to see sometimes when it's further away. So this is about Bolivia. This is in February. An article in the New York Times about Bolivia began. It was all about how most economies in South America at that time were doing poorly. They still haven't emerged from the recession. Blah 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 blah. Uh, and then there's Bolivia. Um, and that's the, that's the line from the New York Times. They list all the problems in South America. And then there's Bolivia. And it proceeds to list all the good news about Bolivia on the economic front, taken from socialist organizations like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and places like that. Real social. And yeah, yeah. So left-wing sources, as usual. <laughs> so here's here's a paragraph from the article. Mr. Oh, and the, the, prime, uh, the president of Bolivia, if you might didn't know, is Evo Morales, who's an uh, indigenous man and a socialist. And um, here's what uh, they say in the New York Times about this. Mr. Morales often speaks harshly of capitalism and some of us, some of its most ardent defenders, like big corporations, the United States, the Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. He nationalized the oil and gas sector after taking office in 2006, and he has expropriated more than 20 private companies in a variety of industries. Yet, while Mr. Morales calls himself a revolutionary, others have begun using a very different word to describe him, prudent. Get it? Yeah. A revolutionary yeah. isn't prudent. It's very different, yeah. right? So after the praise, uh, the Times notes what it calls areas of concern about Bolivia. Why worry? Because, quote, both the Monetary Fund and the World Bank say much more should be done to encourage private investment. Bolivia has less than half the rate of private investment of most other countries in South America, unquote. So in other words, what's the idea? The good economic performance is in spite of the socialist policies, not because of them. They don't argue that. Nobody says, oh, look. They just say it's implied in what they say. And finally, the Times finds as a source a lawyer from Houston who says that Bolivia's good news, quote, is not sustainable in the long term because, quote, the model is not designed to generate substantial profits for the oil industry. <laughs> Unquote. <laughs> so what's the idea, right? Um, all the, and, and actually, this is quite accurate, I think. It's very difficult to create sustainable economic models that are outside of the profit-based global economy. It is very difficult. Ask Cuba. Ask any number of countries. Venezuela. So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Um, so as activists, if we want to respond to some of these things, what I'm suggesting is it's important to understand the concept of propaganda on multiple levels. And actually, the right is much better at that than we are, I think. Um, and so when we argue against proposals, policies, or ideas, we tend to focus on the concrete and say, oh, we shouldn't have that policy. That's a bad policy. We shouldn't have that, um, we, we shouldn't identify that country as the enemy. We tend to argue on that level. What I think we need to do much more of is start arguing on the deeper level. And not just, you know, argue against the policies, but, but on principle basis. And say, this is why that policy, may, not just it's wrong because we don't like it, it's wrong because it doesn't make sense. And so what we want to do is build a resistance in the population, kind of like inoculation, kind of like a vaccination campaign. When you vaccinate enough people, 
the, the disease doesn't perpetuate itself, right? You don't have to get 100%. You just have to get a critical mass. And I'm suggesting in the propaganda level, the same thing applies. If we get, an, we can defend, in fact, I have, a, I have a handout over here somewhere that you can pick up afterwards. Uh, 10 concrete tips for media propaganda self-defense. Well, that's, um, it's a classic, you know, you'll, you'll love it. Um, <laughs> But that's one thing you can do, is defend yourself. But again, in the public health model, it's good to get your inoculation. That's kind of what says some 10 little ways you can give yourself a shot to protect yourself against propaganda. But the bigger issue is a public health campaign to reduce the incidence of propaganda and make the general population less susceptible. And that's what activists have to do. Both of them, um, I think. I want to suggest something that is really counterintuitive to a lot of people, so I'll spend a little time on it. Um, something called the investment theory. It's so important, I have two pages, but I can only find the second one. <laughs> Here it is. This is actually based on the ideas of Thomas Ferguson, if some of you have heard of him, maybe he wrote a book in 1996 called The Golden Rule, The Investment Theory of Money and Politics. I think that's the title. But I'll start with an anecdote. Um, I was listening to NPR. I don't know how to pick on NPR or the New York Times because a lot of people think those are the you know epicenters of liberal. It's a liberal press. <laughs> My point is that propaganda comes from every direction. This one just happens to be about NPR. I was listening. To, it was about 10, 12 years ago. There's a story on calls for restrictions on campaign spending. <laughs> Remember those good old days? <laughs> By lobbyists and political action committees, PACs. In that context, of the reporter, Laurel McCallum, stated that special interests defend their spending as part of the political process. And in support of that point, she quoted Minnesota Medical Association lobbyist David Renner. And here's what he said, quote, I think most PACs, at least our PAC and our activities, are not trying to figure out who we can buy because, first of all, I don't think most Minnesota legislators are buyable. But instead, we look at it based on voting records, based on what has happened, as a way to say, we know your campaigns are expensive. We know you need some assistance. Here's a way for us to assist you. <laughs> now, around the same time, I was in a meeting. There was a little meeting with the editor of the Star Tribune at the time with some, there's a little gathering with influential community members. I have no idea what, I think I snuck in. I have no idea what I was doing there. Um, and he was talking about, he was asking for feedback on how they were covering um, economic issues and I forget what. So I asked a question about the structure of media and I said, um, for example, a person in your position, I said, McClatchy Corporation owned the Star Trip at the time. McClatchy signs your check so we know where they stand, and the advertisers pay the bills so we know what power they have. Now, the other two groups, and I was about to talk about readers and reporters, but he interrupted me and said, now, just to interrupt, your statements aren't following. Just because they advertise doesn't mean they have power. <laughs> really? <laughs> At the same meeting was a guy named Ken Pantel. Some of you might know Ken. He was running for Green, yeah, running for governor at the Green Party at the time. I think it was the year 2000. And uh, just 15, 20 minutes later, he said um, he was commenting on the need for columns on appropriate technology, the power industry, and other underreported issues. And um, the editor's answer was that these are advocacy positions and should not be covered on a regular basis. In this context, he made the following statement, quote, don't misunderstand me. Absolutely, economics has a role in what we do. It doesn't affect our coverage, but we wouldn't have a motoring section if we didn't have lots of advertisers who want to advertise in it. <laughs> you don't have any power, but they just decide what sections are gonna be in the paper. <laughs> so have you noticed we don't have an environment section? That's just what Ken was saying. He didn't use the word power. I think that was the difference. So that, that idea of investing, directing, allocating resources, which is largely and increasingly in the hands of private interests, the ability to allocate resources affects everything we do, but it certainly affects media. 
So when you have somebody like Jeff Bezos, the Amazon billionaire, buying the Washington Post, he's going to allocate resources over time in a certain direction. Uh, and we now have a local billionaire who just bought the Star Tribune. We'll see what happens with that. But the point is, because I w will say that I left out the best part actually about the editor Tim McGuire. He got really offended when I suggested that advertisers have power because he, what he heard was that I was accusing him of being corrupt. That we were that, that advertisers were telling him what to say. And that's the farthest thing from my mind. I don't think the advertisers were telling him what to say, and I don't think any more than the PAC guy was telling legislators what to say. They just watch. And I think this is a key, key point about the investment theory. That people think that corruption happens when people get money and then they do what the person with the money tells them to do. I think that's what most people think corruption is. I'm not denying that happens. I do read the papers. But I'm suggesting that's the least of it. That's saying that behavior follows money. What's much more common is what the Pac-Man says. Money follows behavior. And so the categories, the individuals, the sectors, the sections in the newspaper that will succeed and will rise to prominence and will form the environment in which our ideas of the world, our ABCs, are formulated, are the result of investments. Not because somebody's trying to be, for, for example, uh, I've talked to a lot of reporters over the years. I've been a reporter. Um, but talking to reporters and, and when you talk about, um, you know, why do you say these things? Who's telling you, what, you know, activists do this all the time. I think you talk to reporters. Who, who told you to write that? Why did you interpret it that way? And the response is invariably, nobody tells me what to write. Nobody tells me what to think. Nobody tells me, blah, blah, blah. I think they're probably right. They were hired and promoted to their position based on what they were seen to be doing. That's how corporate, that's how organizations work, but that's certainly how a corporate environment works. Now that's different than telling people what to say, is finding people who will say what you want them to say without being told. If you have to be told, you're not going to be there very long. And you can find examples, Raymond Bonner at the New York Times and other reporters who actually did step out of line and they're gone either voluntarily because they found it so stifling or they were let go. So the system is based on money, which is allocated over time according to the needs of individuals and corporations that have it. That's the lesson. In the context of that, how are we doing for time? Okay. Let me see where I am. Are you still with me? Am I making yeah. sense? Rock on. <laughs> um, oh, I lost my page. Here we go. Well, I want to just briefly mention a, a really common misconception about what media is. Because when you talk about media and market-based media, the Star Tribune or the New York Times or whoever it is, CBS News, people think that like any other you know, sector of the economy, there's, there's three parts. There's a, a buyer, a seller, and a product, right? Well, everybody knows what they are, I think. The, the buyer is you and me. We buy the paper. We, buy, we watch a TV show. The seller is, the, you know, the Star Tribune. And the product is news, right? No, that's not how the media system is. And actually, if you talk to media people, nobody will say that. The product, well, the buyer, the seller is the Star Tribune. I'm picking on the Star Tribune, but it's any company, the, the news organization. The buyer is advertisers, and the product is us, our eyeballs. In fact, they're selling eyeballs to advertisers. That's what they do. That is the business. Now, that common misconception that news organizations' product is news leads to all kinds of crazy things. It's because, well, it also just explains a lot of what happens. So if your job is to get as many people to look at whatever's next to the advertising, so they drift over and see the advertising, what are you going to do? 
are you going to seek out, and I'm not accusing editors or reporters of trying to delude us. I'm just saying that the job on a system level is to deliver consumers to advertisers. So the organization, the media system as a whole, will do and does do that. They do whatever it takes to get people to look. That's why if it bleeds, it leads. In fact, I was talking to an anchor, or a news, or rather a news manager from a local TV station some years ago. And I said, how come, how come, why is it if it bleeds, it leads? And uh, she said, well, you know, we have to draw in the viewers so we can sell ads, so we can, so we can make the money to do journalism. So you have to, so I said, so you have to do sensationalistic news so you can make money, so you can do more sensationalistic news. And the, the, the conversation ended right about then, you know. <laughs> but it's, the point is, she was very honestly saying, this is what we do. We have to draw in viewers to pay our bills and to satisfy shareholders. She didn't say that. But it's a different project than a media system that would be at its root set up to provide information to make a democracy work. So I think we need to really disabuse ourselves of the idea that, and when we talk to media, when we, and I suggest that activists should always have a media component, we were talking about this, always have a media component um, to your, whatever your issue is. Building the bedrock upon which your arguments can rest, the deep propaganda, the propaganda ABCs, is the territory we should be operating in always. So if you go out and say, oh, it's a bad idea to send troops to Iraq, what do you, what stream, what current are you swimming against? That's, that current. Go ahead and make your arguments, and we should be out there with our signs and protesting and all that stuff, and I do it myself. I'm not arguing against that. I'm saying that we need to work on the f soil that those seeds we're planting will grow. If we don't, we're just going to shout, shout, shout. How many of you, uh, I'm going to take a little survey. How many of you have had a conversation that goes kind of like this? You're arguing a point of fact with somebody who doesn't politically agree with you, right? And they say whatever it is, you know. Oh, I know, let's say uh, Saddam Hussein, here's the argument, Saddam Hussein and uh, Osama bin Laden were teaming up, right? They hated each other, you know. It's just a joke from day one. But anyway, a lot of people believed it. So you have an argument with somebody, and you make your argument, and you, you, you end up, and they, they say, and you kind of win the argument. And then you hear something like this. Well, yeah, you might be right. But in general, you know, he's still the kind of guy who's got weapons of mass destruction. Right? So, so you sort of win this tactical battle, but you lose, the, the, the war is elsewhere. God, that's a terrible analogy, isn't it? <laughs> the battle of ideas, the marketplace of ideas. See what I mean about ideology getting in your language? Um, but you, you see what I'm saying? You can win the specific overt propaganda argument, but lose the deep propaganda one. So they're just set up to believe the next story. And you haven't really, we haven't really done much to change the ideological the, the, the structure upon which propaganda rests. That's one of my biggest points. I'm just going to tell a couple stories because I really want to talk a little bit about the idea of systems and dialectics, which I call systolectics. You know, it's my, my new word. What do, you, what do you think? It's the first time I've ever used it in public. Um, these are a couple of examples. One is from the media, one is from literature, and uh, I'll just read them because, like I said, I'm a better writer than speaker. But I'll just say that journalism, another misconception about journalism is that people think the job of a journalist is to write stories or produce stories. The first job of a journalist is to ask questions. In other words, a journalist in the social function of journalism is to act as surrogates for you and me, those of us who can't go to Iraq, can't go to the presidential news conference, can't go wherever the action is. Somebody goes in our stead and ideally asks the questions that we would ask Right? If we could go there. So to the degree that those journalists fulfill that role, that's the degree to which I think we have an effective journalistic system. But the key point is they ask questions. That's where it starts. What we read or see is the answers to those questions. 
and which questions they are shape the news we see, obviously. So this is New Year's Eve, last New Year's Eve in the New York Times. The headline was, Accountability is Elusive in Garment Supply Chain. And online, the headline was even better. Clothing brands sidestep blame for safety lapses. And the article uh, focuses on a Spanish clothing company called Mango. The Times calls it a, a global fashion brand. It's a corporation, in other words, which ships 60 million garments a year. Some of them were being made in a factory called Phantom Tuck, which operated out of the Rana Plaza factory, which you might remember is the one that collapsed last uh, April, April and a half ago, um, uh, and killed, I forget how many people. Now, eight months later, says the Times, the question is, what responsibility Mango and other brands should bear toward the victims of Rana Plaza, a disaster that exposed the murkiness and lack of accountability in the global supply chain for clothes. Under intense international pressure, four brands agreed last week to help finance a landmark $40 million compensation fund for the victims, unquote. The Times says that's the question is what responsibility Mango should bear. Now, for a systems thinker, that's not the question at all. The question is, what is the nature of the system that leads to such tragic outcomes? So we switch from who, who is to blame, who is accountable, we switch to what is going on, which includes accountability, it, but it doesn't include blame. Because the nature of systems is, well, actually, let me divert. I'll read my other excerpt. This is from The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. And if, if you know the novel at all, you know that it starts out with a bunch of poor tenant farmers in Oklahoma being evicted from their land by the, by the mean bankers. Um, so we're, we, we'll tune in and listen to the tenant farmers. One of the tenant farmers goes out to confront a guy driving the bulldozer, that's bulldozing his, his farm. He comes out and he says to the guy on the bulldozer, he says, why, you're Joe Davis's boy. Sure, the driver said. Well, what you doing this kind of work for? Against your own people. Three dollars a day. I got damn sick of creeping for my dinner and not getting it. I got a wife and kids, we gotta eat. Three dollars a day and it comes every day. <laughs> That's right, the tenant said, but for your three dollars a day, 15 or 20 families can't eat at all. Nearly a hundred people have to go out and wander on the roads for your three dollars a day, is that right? And the driver said, can't think of that. Gotta think of my own kids. Three dollars a day and it comes every day. Times are changing, mister, don't you know? Can't make a living on the land unless you got two, five, ten thousand acres and a tractor. Cropland isn't for little guys like us anymore. You don't kick up a howl because you can't make Fords or because you're not at the telephone company. Well, crops are like that now. Nothing to do about it. You try to get three dollars a day someplace, that's the only way. Shortly before the above confrontation, we meet the owner men who've come to talk to the tenant farmers, and uh, Steinbeck says, quote, some of the owner men were kind because they hated what they had to do. And some of them were angry because they hated to be cruel. And some of them were cold because they had long ago found that one could not be an owner unless one were cold. And all of them were caught in something larger than themselves. And when the owner men explain to the farmers that there's something larger that's responsible for the displacement and that the bank isn't like a man, unlike the Citizens United, which says the corporations are people, yeah. um, the farmers make the familiar argument, yes, but the bank is made only made of men. And here Steinbeck says, in the voice of the owner men, no, you're wrong there, quite wrong there, say the owner men. The bank is something else than men. It happens that every man in a bank hates what the bank does, and yet the bank does it. The bank is something more than men, I tell you. It's the monster. Men made it, but they can't control it. So that's what I'm talking about. A system that will do what it will do based on power centers, the structures, the factors that gave, it, gave, gave rise to it, and the benefit from it. A system will tend to perpetuate itself. And systems are not 
freestanding. Every system is composed of smaller systems. So what I call the media, and I have this argument, a friend of mine is a reporter for NPR. He's always yelling at me because I call it the media, and he says, media is the plural of medium. It's like, no, no, media is the collection of all the various outlets that make an, a, the institution called the media. And it's, so uh, the media system is composed of smaller systems like NBC, CBS, Star Tribune, the Wasiga uh, Journal, my hometown paper. And uh, it's also part of larger systems, the larger information system, the larger economic system, the global capital system. So what I'm getting at is focusing on blame in that context gets us nowhere. And actually, in a certain sense, we have to be careful even when we delve into politics, electoral politics, because a lot of people are motivated by the idea that a good person will do it differently. Or if we get rid of the bad people, everything will be different. Have you noticed that we, we've done a lot of getting rid of people and a lot of getting some good people in, and there are good people in office, but things don't seem to change direction much, yeah. right? So how do we argue against that? We talk about systems. It doesn't mean you ignore the individuals. It doesn't mean there is no accountability. But if you change, for example, a great question that Melissa uh, couldn't even answer, because how could you? How different is it now that we have a different sheriff? Well, not that different, probably. Like she said, there's undoubtedly some changes, but the system that demands surveillance is in place. Anybody who runs for office really wanting to change, well, here, a little digression. Have you ever noticed, everybody has noticed, I'm sure, when there's a big election, a statewide election or a presidential election, well, presidential, we already have the front runners. We already have the viable candidates for 2016. We're well, not all of them. We know who's, who's major, right? Nobody's voted yet. Why are they major? Because they're the ones getting investment. If you don't get major investment, you're not a major candidate. If you're not a major candidate, you don't win. If you want to change the systems and not just discipline the actors, you will not get the investment. And you won't be a major candidate, and the system will perpetuate itself. Just an example. So I want to talk a little bit about, just briefly, are we doing okay? Is this, is this going on too long? No, no, no. Because no? I can, I can always stop talking. Uh, and have you guys do an exercise, actually. But I want to just illustrate a little bit, because it's foreign, the, 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 the hegemonic or the, the dominant thought system in this country is really what I call individualized thinking. Um, because it's based on uh, an individualistic worldview. Um, what I'm suggesting is what I call systolectics or sy systems orientation. And I'll just give some examples of the difference. And, and it's, I hesitate to do it because it makes it seem like it's only two choices. And one of the dominant ideological concepts in American ideology is dualism, actually. So don't get me wrong. This is just a contrast for purposes of contrast. In the dominant system, I'll call it IT, individualized thinking. You get closer. You take things apart to see how the pieces work. That's how you get to know what something is, right? In a systems orientation, you, can, uh, you have to back away because you only understand how things work by seeing the whole. Things are defined by their behavior in relation to other things even systems. So whatever system you're looking at, back up and see what system is that part of. And what role is it fulfilling in that system? Don't get closer in. Um, there's something called, in individualized thinking, IT, something called, here I get academic briefly, methodological individualism, which is the view that social phenomena can only be understood by examining how they result from the motivations and actions of individual agents. In systems orientation, we focus on outcomes rather than intentions. And that's where blame loses its meaning. Because if you see a system has predictable outcomes, not guaranteed outcomes, because the future isn't written yet, but it's predictable outcomes based on the nature of the system, then you're not blaming people when they will carry out the actions that are required, because they're doing it because somebody else couldn't or wouldn't do it, and they need $3 a day, it comes every day. 
right? And we all know how the average American worker at every level is so stressed, so pressured to even have a job that a lot of us are willing to do just about anything. Even if we know it's something we wouldn't do if we didn't need that $3 a day. In IT, it's cause-based. Things happen because someone or something made them happen. That leads to heroes, it leads to villains, it leads to good guys, it leads to bad guys. Systems orientation says that systems produce outcomes for a variety of complex reasons. So terror can't be explained by some X number of people who are crazy, hateful, insane, irrational, fanatical, whatever. That there may be people like that. But what gives rise to terrorism is something else. I've written about this, I won't go into it now. Um, IT says that there's one way causation. A makes B happen. SO, systems orientation says, talks about the mutuality of interaction. We shape our environment and our environment shapes us. Media, for example, um, both shapes and reflects public opinion. Because by wanting to reach a mass audience, they're trying to reach, you know, speak in terms that most people will go along with. So they're reflecting public opinion. But by doing that, that forms a foundation for their stories, which then reinforces that public opinion, and there the cycle goes. IT says that things are static. Things are the way they are, because that's how they are. So just deal with it. Uh, Systolectics says things do change, and then the question is how are they gonna change? And we all play a part in that. If we do nothing, we maintain the current system. This is the meaning of if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Systems will tend to perpetuate unless we interrupt them. Systems and media systems, ideological systems, will stay the way they are in, if everybody just shuts up. If you just don't say anything, it just cranks along. You have to consciously interrupt. Like doing crazy things like chalking sidewalks with messages challenging the dominant system. You can get in trouble for it. But that shakes things up. And somebody's gonna see that and say, oh, that's what they're upset about. Oh, maybe they aren't just unemployed lazy bums out there. Maybe they're actually trying to say something. That's where you get in trouble. Um, IT is based largely on description to understand something. Where is it? How big is it? What color is it? Et cetera, et cetera. Systems orientation is based on function. What does it do? What's it supposed to do? What does it have to do? Um, this is a tricky one for people. Individualized thinking says that things are true or they're false. In fact, I have people ask me this in my media classes all the time. How do you find sources that will tell you the truth? Here I go back to what I said at the beginning. Any fact connects to other facts. So whether it's true or false depends on the ideational context in which it lands. I'm not saying there isn't reality out there. I'm just saying that how it's presented and how it's understood for political activists is more important than some abstract idea of what this is true. Because every candidate and every marketer of products knows that the important thing is how people feel about what they're selling. That's not about true and false. That's about all these other parts of what I call the, the American ideology, or actually the American thought system. What's good, what's bad, and media shapes that many ways. One last example. This is from the New York Times of June 3rd. Um, if you remember, that was right around the time the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, put out the rules about coal burning and regulations on emissions. Here's the front page. Democrats in coal country run from EPA. Now let's go to, let's go to page 16, shall we? Oh, I will. <laughs> um, and here's where you see my highlighting. On the bottom of page 16, health experts see benefits in push to cut pollution. 
And, you know, again, these are some kind of bunch of crazies like the American Lung Association and the Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease Foundation and, you know, the American Thoracic Society, those kind of people. And they all unanimously agree that these regulations are going to make people healthier, fewer people are going to die, it's going to cut health care costs dramatically, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is that front page news to you? Perhaps. Not to the New York Times. Because the New York Times is focused on what Democrats are going to do. Who's going to win? Who's going to benefit from this? Is Obama going to do better? Is it going to open the door for the Republicans? What about, what's the Tea Party going to do? Who's going to win? What, what's, where's the poll? Where's the survey? What's happening? You know, that's that process, which happens again and again and again, and if I had longer, I'd give you more examples. Um, that's how ideology is passed on. The, the message is there. But the main message, of course, is what's important. But for people who are sort of journalists, the message is, and I don't know if you know this, every day, I think it's still true, I haven't looked recently, every day the, the, over the wires, about mid-afternoon, comes a little bulletin telling um, news editors all over, the, all over the country what is going to be on the front page of the New York Times tomorrow. So they know what's news. That's why when you turn on the news in the morning, you hear NPR, Star Tribune, uh, any talk show you talk to, they're talking about whatever's in the New York Times that day. How do they know? <laughs> well, now you know. <laughs> so, and what comes with that feed is priorities and values. So they're going to tend to talk, and most people look at the front page if they look at anything. And so what are they going to know? What are they going to think about? Not just what are they going to know. What are they going to think is the story? What's important here? That somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose something. But who are the important people that are winning and losing? Is it the people with chronic pulmonary conditions? Is it people having heart attacks? Or is it the democratic strategists who are really trying to get Franken back into office? I'm not picking on Franken, but anybody, or Ted Cruz back in office. So you see what I'm saying? There's a set of values that come with the news that have to do with the media's pet, I call it pet, placement, emphasis, and tone. The first choice is what even goes in the news at all, and as the media system is chronically underfunded now, because guess what? You might have heard, the internet is wrecking everything. <laughs> You know, now marketers can reach people much more directly, so they don't generate journalism to do it because that's not what they're about. They generate views and hits, and you can do that better online. So as the, 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 the money it takes that advertising used to pay for to produce what journalism there was is shrinking, so now the news is even more uh, dependent on press releases, public relations releases, video news releases. Have you heard of the VNR? Those are the things that public relations firms put out. They're actual videos that some TV news stations play in their entirety as if they were news stories. <laughs> VNR, that call. So the, the ideas that we used to have a beat, and this is where activists, as we set up our own media organizations, we need to think about beats, as in, like NPR has the, the court beat, and the capital beat, and the whatever beat. How about the activism beat? How about the environmental beat? Not Health Inc. How about the healthcare beat? Those are the kind of things we need to be setting up and somehow figure out how we can pay for doing actual journalism, the kind of journalism that tells us, those of us stuck here in Minnesota or anywhere that can't go to Iraq, that can't go to Washington, that can't go to wherever the news is, or for example, how many people know about the uh, something called the uh, Plan for Good Living in, in uh, Ecuador? Anybody heard of it? Nobody's heard of it. Yumak Kase. It's an indigenous term for loosely translated as good living, but it really is a life that incorporates spiritual, um, material, and um, some other. It's, it's a broad concept of, of good living. 
that the government of Ecuador is actually in process of developing. They have a plan right now. You can look online. Good li plan for good living, 1913, 19, or 19, 2013, 2017. Look it up. And uh, they're trying to figure out how they can create a post-capitalist economy in, and in all areas. It's a comprehensive thing involving all kinds of indigenous people, all kinds of voices from all over the place. Nobody's heard of it, because why would they? That's not the way to get advertisers. <laughs> You know, we need to set up a system, a journalistic system that starts to tell us about what's happening in Ecuador. It starts to tell us what government programs work and why they work. Why does Social Security work as well as it does, and why is it under attack? Let's be reporting on that. Let's be reporting on the the health effects of coal and not just the electoral college effects. These kind of things. So as we come to understand better, I'm arguing, the nature of media and the nature of propaganda as operating on these multiple levels, sometimes consciously, mostly as a result of the creation of systems that serve power, then we know what to do. As activists, we need to first of all incorporate media work in everything we do to counter some of the propaganda that's out there, because 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 you know why. And the other thing is, we need to, and this is what my handout's about, be aware that all of us, including me, and everybody in this room, and everybody, I think, everywhere, because it's so subtle, because some of these deep ideas, the ABCs of propaganda, are not overtly argued, but they're just assumed. They function as the premises for stories. They function as the uh, superstructure that's never talked about because it's assumed to be generally accepted. We need to defend ourselves against some of these ideas and the ways of thinking, the way of thinking that says, if something happens, somebody must be to blame, leads us to argue and spend a lot of energy, as li especially liberals and progressives, spend a lot of energy trying to increase regulation. We should be trying to change the system because we're tr when you're trying to regulate a profit-based system to make less profit, guess what? If you're trying to work on the system, and I'm not arguing against regulation, I'm just saying that that's not the answer. It's not the end. Do that, and while you're doing it, say, you know, the reason we have to regulate this is because it's based on profit, and that's the problem. How can we set up a healthcare system that's not? So that's the level we have to argue at at all times, multiple levels. That's my point, really. Let me see, I'm gonna look at my notes and see what my point really was, because I wrote it down. <laughs> I want to have some time for questions, but... Oh no, I meant... <laughs> no. In summary, there is a dominant thought system in place, one that functions to manufacture consent to the broad agenda of those in power. The thought system is supported by an immense propaganda system composed of various doctrinal institutions that interact with each other. The thought system reflects the interests of power centers in the culture and goes about its work for the most part independently of the desires or intentions of those within it. The key to this is the ability of power centers to allocate resources in service to elite needs. One of those needs is to have a supportive and or passive population. I'm out of fingers. Where was I? We make meaning of new information by connecting it with information that we already have inside of us. And they're inside of us due to the workings of various doctrinal institutions. Propaganda thus appears in both overt and deep forms. O overt to get us to believe something, deep to have us already believe something so that we will believe the, the overt. So the big lesson really is that operating systolectically is the key to building a movement. Because if we understand that things change, things happen, 
and things change due to a complex mix of factors that don't result in, don't cause things to happen, but something can be a tipping point. If a system is unstable and you push it a little bit, it'll fall over. If it's stable, you can push all day and it's not going to go anywhere. Our job is to make it less stable and push. And the, leave it there. See, I'm, like I said, I'm a better writer than talker. But there, I didn't mean to go this long. Are there any quick questions? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat them, too. Uh, my name's Alan Hancock, member of the Green Party. I recommend everybody reading a book called Deep Green Resistance. Deep Green, Deep green Resistance? Yeah, and it points on a lot of the things you mentioned. And he says he's almost as smart as I am. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no, no, it's got really good points. Okay. Deep. Who wrote it? Author? Author. Who's the author of that? Uh, McVay, Keith, and Jensen, three authors. Oh, okay. I do want to make one last point in relation to that, that I think really important, one of the things that's an obstacle to building a movement is we tend to compete with each other, and we tend to sort of say, what you're doing isn't as important as what I'm doing, or you know, you're missing the point, we're doing the real work. If you think system, systems, that fades away because you see that you don't know where the tipping point is going to come. So maybe working on environmental stuff over here, working on economic stuff over here, working on uh, surveillance stuff over here, one of those, if we, if we all work and support each other, the overall larger capital-based, profit-based system gets less stable, and who knows what it'll tip to. Oh, it seems like, well, first of all, thanks for your newsletter. It's oh, good. Testimonial. I'm trying to think of, of some solutions, you know? And so it seems like the problem, in a way, is that soil you're talking about, you know, sowing seeds of, of even critical thinking. And, and yeah. yes. People just accept, you know, like you said. Mm -hmm. So it seems like... You know, we got to start in kindergarten, actually. Yeah, that's you know? right. So how is the education system right. and religion system, you know, that's right. veneered over the truth, too. Right. So right. how do you start yeah. putting seeds of truth in, in the educational system? The question is, if, if there's all these doctrinal institutions, where do you start? What do you do? Do you start at the young age when kids go to school? Sure you do. Uh, but you also work at the media level. And you also work at the higher education level. The right wing is good at this, by the way. Have you noticed how much energy they put into educational stuff? Yeah. Well, they know what they're doing. <laughs> they're talking about deep propaganda. They want their kids to be, they want the soil that comes out of schools to be fertile for their seeds. Our job, like you said, is to is to work at, that's just one, what I'm saying is you, you work on all these different levels and so you you try to inoculate kids so they don't aren't so susceptible to propaganda and you also work on the media so when it comes at them there isn't as much of it and suddenly they have room in their brains for some independent thoughts and I just want to argue with the conception of what's called critical thinking. <laughs> Could you, that implies that there's thinking that isn't critical. What would that be? <laughs> Propaganda. Uh, my acronym for media is making everyone donor in America. <laughs> <laughs> Works for me. Assume that you're being lied to. It's called rational skepticism. Uh, now, one of the reasons we're here is for peace and for an investigation into the military industrial surveillance complex. So we should pay tribute to journalists like Gary Webb and Danny Castellero and Michael Hastings and Aaron Swartz, who gave his life for why we're here. Now, uh, I'm a little bit more cynical than you are, uh, and I was defined by a Pulitzer winner, a journalist, that my cynicism comes because I'm, uh, I'm an informed optimist. And uh, we have to be very selective of the media. Um, I've been interviewed by the New York Times, by the Washington Post, by uh, 60 Minutes, a senior executive producer for 60 Minutes. You can give them a story that makes water look like a parking ticket. 
A couple of comments real quick. Um, one is the idea that we're always being lied to. I would gently challenge that, say that if you think in terms of investment and think of how people rise up to the media ranks, for the most part, they're not lying. They're interpreting the world the way they have been socialized to do so. We see it as lies, but what I'm suggesting is that's not very fruitful. We should be working at the level like Bridget talked about uh, and others. Of where, where do those reporters, the elite reporters who set the agenda, why does so much of what comes out of their outlets end up being misleading? Functionally, it's lies, but they're not lying. That's what we need to be working on as we set up systems ourselves. How do we get people to break out of that box, that box that leads to war and imperialism? What, what, I don't know how much time we have. One more question? One more? One more? Uh, I don't know. Done. You covered a lot of ground. I want to get one term that's helpful uh, in teaching sociology and propaganda and public opinion. One term useful is is labeling theory. And labeling theory. Labeling one term that's useful is labeling theory. People who control the power have the most power can label and make it stick. People with power can label things and make it stick. Those for instance if it's if it's torture or if it's something else, those people did it, then therefore they're the world criminal. Right. We can do the same thing with Vietnam and the other right. kill thousands of people, all kinds of weapons. That's not the same labeling. Right. So in discussions, you need to clarify labeling sticks when you have the most power. Right. Governments and those who advertise right. those and those so forth. So what he's, he's saying, just to repeat, he's saying that, for example, when they do it, the identified they, it's it's a war crime. When we do the same thing, it's national defense or something because power dictates the labels that stick. And that relates to no matter terrorists. Mm -hmm. We are not terrorists. We are not terrorists. Of course, when it's in Vietnam, it's in Trump. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They're terrorists. We can never do this for us. We sure need to accurately use right. the same way. Yep. We're excusing ourselves. We need people listen to the news on TV or otherwise and think they have the news. It's already been sent to right. And I, I don't know how many people are hearing most of this, but we're starting to threaten to cut into lunch hours. So I'm a little hesitant to go too much longer. But thanks, Don. And um, yep. there's much more to say. It's obviously hugely complex, but hopefully it is a little helpful. Talk to me afterwards and sign up for the newsletter if you want. Good. The clipboard is going around, so you don't have to proactively sign up. It'll come to you, and then you sign up.